Um, I'll just kick us off with a little bit of context. So this was the uh, entirety of the prompt um, for our problem pack. And so um, obviously this left a lot of room for us to kind of define the scope of this project. Um, for the most part, we came in with very little background and understanding of biochar and its productions, its end markets, and uh, certainly basically no um, background in sawmills. Uh, and so this was very much a, um, an exercise in uh, learning and trying to just immerse ourselves in, in kind of both of these industries. Um, and so we decided to spend most of our, most of our time, like some other groups, reaching out and trying to uh, speak with folks in you know, sawmill operators, um, biochar producers, uh, and lots of folks kind of in between um, uh, in one industry or the other or both, um, as well as reading uh, as much as we could about you know, any existing or, or, or prior kind of efforts to pursue uh, biochar production um, at sawmills. And so um, today we're not necessarily going to be opining on uh, exactly where uh, or whether a specific project would be viable, but um, we'll kind of share our findings and what we've learned and what we kind of see as the key considerations and factors in determining the feasibility of a project like this. Uh, and just want to note, um, like the former group, our kind of output was a paper. We're still um, editing that. And so we will, we look forward to sharing that uh, more broadly once we kind of get that polished up. Um, but so today we're just kind of going to chat through uh, our findings and thoughts. So with that, uh, Sam, do you want to kick us off and give us a little bit of that uh, sawmill context? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Adam. So we spoke to eight parent companies uh, that operate sawmills in the US and the UK, some of which own a number of sawmills and some of which were just one sawmill. And the sawmills, they produce byproducts or, or residues that are bark, sawdust, shavings, and wood chips. And they make up around 50% of the log in total. Next slide, please, John. When we were speaking to the sawmills, our first discovery was that all of these companies we spoke to are either using or selling their residues into various industries, such as pulp and paper, chipboard, MDF board, horticultural use for mulch landscaping, animal bedding, like in the equestrian market, or into compressing the, the fuel in, into pellets or fuel logs, and also combined heat and power generation from biomass boilers, where the heat's used for the kilns that drive the timber and the residual power is sold back to the grid. And residual prices vary between 10 to 80 tons, sorry, 10 to $80 per ton. It depends on the, the log price at the time, the local market, transportation to the client and the residue type. Sawmills and bio, sawmills with biomass boilers, also they get the value from the process energy that they save and from the electricity that's sold back to the grid. So the conclusion, all these companies, they're very aware of the value of their byproducts and they seem to be operating in a sustainable way. However, uh, we did discover that the state of Arkansas has an excess of wood waste, which they're struggling to dispose of. And that's due to the, the current high demand for, for lumber and the EPA environmental regulations that limit wood chip burning. And that, that speaking to the person there, they, they'd happily load their waste for free uh, if someone would take it away. So there's, there's an opportunity there. Next slide, please, John. So are sawmills aware of the biochar market? From the companies we spoke to, in the US, the answer is yes. In the UK, the answer is no. Although the UK Biochar Research Centre is in talks with a large sawmill company in the UK. So in the US, uh, Tet and West is working with a biochar company who gets paid for the carbon credits, but there's no demand for the product. Frere's Lumber Co have tried selling biochar for years uh, in the form of concrete, wastewater, soil markets, but again, they've just found there's no demand. 
and Warehouser, they also reported a lack of demand and raised the issue of the upfront costs. So in summary, the sawmills are interested in, in the biochar market, but they want to focus on their lumber business, their core business, and capital costs, the expertise required, the demand for the product and risk, they're all barriers for the sawmills in setting up a scaled biochar, biochar production. But there are opportunities for them to partner with uh, companies like uh, biochar companies like Pacific Biochar. So next, uh, Nancy's gonna to talk to us about uh, the biochar markets. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, so we wanted to find out how sawmills could um, use the biochar that they produced. So in addition to the sawmills, we've talked to two biochar producers, uh, Pacific Biochar and Hagel Enterprises. Uh, and uh, a couple other people shared their time with us, uh, Peter Oliver from The Burning Question and uh, the uh, Urban Drawdown Initiative. And what we found out was um, that there are markets for biochar, but its potential depends on three factors. Um, fully capturing the biochar output and the ener energy output from the pyrolysis process. Uh, matching the process, uh, the product to the needs and resources of the end user, and also making the connections that drive demand on a local and regional basis. Um, next slide, please. Um, this carbon sequestering material is used uh, mainly in agriculture, uh, environmental remediation, and industrial processes. Uh, the agricultural applications are the largest market at this time, uh, and this farm-based use may be the low-hanging fruit for sawmills looking to develop um, a market for their biochar. Farmers, home gardeners, landscapers, vineyards, cannabis growers, and golf courses are among those that use uh, biochar uh, mainly as a soil amendment. And recently biochar um, was approved in California to be used as animal feed. Um, commercial farmers need to source a good quality biochar and this type can be generated from sawmill biomass. Brett Kenkarn from the Urban Drawdown Initiative spoke to us about how biochar can be used in an urban forest and be a community-based economic opportunity. Local governments have, uh, can save money by putting their wood waste uh, to good use in community-based landscaping, stormwater management, and forest health, recycling what would be a disposal cost. And, um, we thought that unlocking uh, the local governments as a market for biochar seemed like a really exciting opportunity. Um, environmental pollution is a huge problem and the repurposing of sawmill waste has applications in the management of stormwater air pollution and in oil field remediation among others. On the industrial side, Hago uh, Energetics is working to convert uh, this biomass waste into other high value products such as hydrogen and methanol for which there is already an active market. And um, biochar can be used um, as carbon friendly fillers for concrete roads and wood composites. And more experimentally, uh, biochar can be used to produce a low carbon jet fuel. Next slide, please. Um, there are a number of barriers uh, to sawmill success in the biochar market. Uh, with the biggest uh, being the need to cre create demand. Uh, like most new technologies, we need to start with a lot of education um, and adding in community engagement, boots on the ground, technical support, and accessible financing options will help uh, the biochar producers direct end users on the way that they can incorporate um, biochar into their practices. Lowering the cost of biochar is a huge factor in creating a market for um, for demand. On the supply side, producers uh, need help acquiring the capital and incentives to purchase machinery and make the product. Currently, the landscape requires more funders provide capital and um, good climate policy. Transportation costs of biochar on both the supply and demand side may alter environmental metrics and can tip the benefit balance. So uh, the dollar cost and emissions used in trucking the raw biomass to the production facilities needs to be a consideration as is uh, its delivery costs to the end user. Now I will pass this on to Adam. Thank you, Sam and Nancy. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, pick up where, um, where Nancy was, was bringing us there uh, in terms of thinking through the, the feasibility uh, aspect of this. Um, so 
uh, we didn't have uh, we did some research uh, to try to understand kind of what those capital requirements looked like um, and uh, you know the 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 Pyrolysis process kind of on site, as Sam alluded to, can, can actually be quite efficient in that you have everything in one place. You can uh, ideally um, avoid the transportation costs and emissions, uh, and then you can make use uh, of the byproducts, the, the, the uh, syngas that comes out of the pyrolysis process for uh, heating um, and, and energy systems that exist within the sawmill. So, um, in that sense, there's a strong kind of value proposition there. The challenge is, um, as, as Nancy alluded to, the demand is, um, is not necessarily there to make a strong uh, financial case for the upfront cost. So diving into those costs, we found kind of a wide range of estimates, but um, we think that to, to basically retrofit a pyrolysis system, uh, at a sawmill would cost somewhere between uh, 500,000 to several million dollars. Um, and that's dependent on a lot of factors, um, the existing kind of infrastructure of the sawmill, um, the, the volume of biomass that you need to process, uh, obviously the type of system and the quality of biochar that that yields. So there, there are a lot of factors in that. But Ultimately, to Sam's point, th this would involve uh, sawmill taking a substantial financial burden on in order to fund what would be basically an ancillary revenue stream for them. And so, um, you know, again, thinking about the demand, the feedback that we got was really in order to fund something like this, um, we explored kind of a few opportunities, um, but what we found throughout was that in order to, to fund something like this, it would really require a substantial offtake agreement up front uh, in order to guarantee that demand and, and the ability to ultimately uh, generate revenue beyond the revenue being generated from some of those other end uses for the waste products that Sam uh, spoke about. And so um, that is, a, is quite, a, quite a difficult hurdle to get past um, with the demand constraints that we've heard kind of universally. Um, and that demand would need to be fairly localized, again, because of the transportation costs. It's not a very high value product. And so when you incorporate the emissions and cost of transportation, um, it can quickly kind of erase those margins. Um, we did a bit of research to understand public private partnerships and um, grants and uh, incentives and things of that nature. And um, we found that these, these are gonna be highly contextual and localized, of course. And, what we found, speaking with Brett um, from Urban Drawdown that, that Nancy mentioned, um, a lot of the kind of municipal efforts around neutrality or, or uh, carbon sequestration tend to be more urban focused. Uh, and so that is not where sawmills tend to be located. Uh, and so um, that, that's also a challenge. Um, so uh, the other big piece here obviously is the carbon credit opportunity and I'm going to speed through this. I know we have one minute. Um, there are a lot of challenges around carbon credits. Firstly, uh, there are only two certifying bodies that we found for biochar carbon credits. Um, and those are both pictured here, the EBC and the IBI. And worth noting that these are both industry groups. Uh, these are not uh, broader certifying bodies that you see creating standards for some of the other nature-based uh, offsets solutions. Um, and so we think that this ultimately reflects that there's limited demand for these credits at this time. Um, in December, Vera announced that they would be working on a biochar standard. That's a great indicator that there's growing interest here. Um, uh, and currently, um, Pacific Biochar is selling carbon credits. I believe they're the first uh, certified seller in the United States of biochar carbon credits in the voluntary market. They're priced at $74 per ton. Uh, that's substantially higher than a lot of the natural solutions in forestry and agriculture that we've seen, uh, but certainly lower than um, many engineered solutions. And so it, it's just very early for the, the carbon markets here and um, certification is a difficult process, requires you to already be producing and have samples, meaning that um, kind of pre-selling credits 
would not play a role in the actual financing of the installation and, and the production. So um, last slide, uh, very quickly, just some kind of takeaways here for us. We think there's a big opportunity to derive financial and environmental value from sawmill waste. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot being left on the table there. Um, but sawmills seem to be resistant to this opportunity unless it demonstrates a strong financial opportunity and or somebody can de-risk this investment. And that's not the case um, currently, except in a few situations like what Pacific Biochar has done. Um, and so we think ultimately the biggest obstacle here, and we're seeing progress, but is the kind of limited demand both for biochar and for biochar offsets. We think if those can continue to scale and grow, which it seems they are, uh, we're excited about the opportunities in this space. Thanks.